All right. We got a lot to talk about and some interesting video to share. Jared Bedke's here. He's a cattleman extraordinaire. Uh, what do you call yourself? A cesspool of worthless information. But tonight you're going to tell us all about... Re repository of worthless repository. information. Repository. Not the same as a suppository. But tonight you're going to tell us all about... <laughs> so this is what's going on here is... Uh, I, man, if you we're going to show a bunch of Twitter videos and pictures, which will really, I think, blow people away. But this is exactly what you would you would think uh, as you're looking at it. It's a bunch of tractors blocking highways in the Netherlands over emissions cuts. Uh, and Jared, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. I'm hearing myself. I yes, I did, I'm too. I accidentally had the YouTube feed open. And so it was okay. looping back through me. Yeah. OK, just making sure. So. But what what we're hearing is that, and this goes back a couple years, as I've done some research, is that farmers are demanding the scrapping of recently announced plans by the Hague-based government, which could see a 30% reduction in livestock. The Netherlands is the world's second largest agricultural exporter, one of the top greenhouse gas emitters in Europe, especially of nitrogen, with much of this blamed on cattle-produced manure and fertilizer. Farmers say they are being unfairly targeted as opposed to big business and industry, with many vowing to resist any plans to scale down or close farms. Traffic came to a standstill for kilometers around the towns of uh, well, Stro, east of Amsterdam, as farmers and their tractors arrived from across the country to protest. And you just see these huge tractors. Um, basically, what they're saying in this article is that the Dutch government plans to cut greenhouse gas nitrogen by as much as 70% in 131 key areas and by 2030. So that's coming up. Uh, most of these areas close to nature reserves and they want to reach climate goals. Uh, and that's why they're doing it. Farmers may see a 40% drop in emissions. That's what they're expected and would be required around 30% less cattle, according to reports. Now, I mean, I don't know how, how much you trust all these numbers, but you know, if you look at some of the stuff on Twitter, like watch this video while we're talking, this is what it looks like in some of the highways. And I mean, I guess the simplified is that farmers are just pissed right now. So <laughs> I don't know what, what I guess. What's your initial thought on all this? Because I've heard this could get even worse. Uh, it's on the, some cases on the border of Germany um, that, you know, could there be food shortages because of this, at least in this area? What is the connection to the United States? I mean, we could go down a lot of paths, but where do you want to start? Well, what I'm going to say is it's 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 quite bizarre and it's counterintuitive. You see, they're complaining that they can't get fertilizer out of Russia, and that's going to cause them this. But when you buy commercial fertilizer, you get three numbers. The first number on that is nitrogen. So they're trying to cut nitrogen emissions while complaining that they can't get enough nitrogen in to fertilize their soil. So I'm not sure what the hell they're talking about. Does, does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you when you say you they, who are you talking about? The government well, or uh, yes? If if okay. you're gonna, if the if the Dutch government is going to say we want to reduce nitrogen, which is seventy five percent of our atmosphere, by twenty thirty or or whatever number they want to come into, it's got to be disingenuous because out of the other side of their mouth, they're blaming Russia for not exporting fertilizer, which is predominantly nitrogen. Mm hmm. So that's interesting. My solution is, is I guess put the cow shit on the fields. That's <laughs> what, how, how does that hurt you? If, if you're what I thought that was... you can't get nitrogen, then you can't cut back on manure and claim that you're you're in a nitrogen shortage. You're, you're making your own problem. It, it, it's very bizarre to me. One of the videos that's come out, I, I thought was funny is some word that I have no idea about. If somebody speaks um, Dutch, right? <laughs> when I, one time I said Argentinian and everyone's like Spanish. So I just want to make sure I have, it, I have it right. But maybe you could translate for us. But I know what it says under that, fake news. So I love that like protesters now all over the world have co-opted the American way of <laughs> railing against the media and what's going on. So I, I, I'll play this too. And then we'll just show, cause there, there are crazy videos of them like spraying manure at these government buildings. And, um, they brought their cows, I think to parliament. I'll show all of that in a second, but I'm, you know, 
I don't, I, I, I know farmers are starting to kind of get fed up. And, and I think people who have watched this channel long enough know that I am, me personally, I'm very particular about buying direct. I like regenerative farming. I wish we were totally regenerative when it comes to agriculture. But I also understand that consumers are not moving in that direction. And I, I, I'm curious from your standpoint, like when we start with the government cracking down and we don't start with the the demand, like you, like what, wh what position I guess does that put the farmer in? Because I am sympathetic to the situation, even if I like, you know, I, I wish we were going in, in, in a different direction faster. I also don't, I don't know how you force farmers to do a different methodology when that increases their costs and consumers are not paying for it or not interested in it. Uh, you don't, we just quit. <laughs> Then that's that's the bottom line, is if you want to run your guys out of business and have nothing to eat, then keep doing this. There's no problem that government can't make worse. That's that's the underlying premise of all this, is that um, compelled anything that is not that is not driven by basically the ground up is if you have any kind of a top down policy, it's got to fail because you're only solution then is force and violence against those on the bottom in order to compel them to do something that they otherwise wouldn't naturally do. That gets back to Milton Friedman and, and just basic economics. Meh says nitrogen issue fake news is what it says. <laughs> well, so unfortunately, Bedke is a Germanic name, not a, not a Dutch name. So. And also says, can't put it on the field. Regulation says you have to inject it. I think we mm -hmm. have stuff like that here, don't we? Uh, not anywhere that I'm aware of. Um, oh, I feel I feel like that's maybe it's not policy, but I remember doing stories back when I was TV news about about that. Maybe it wasn't a inject, rule. Well, they used to inject um, uh, anhydrous ammonia all the time because it would evaporate. They couldn't spray it on because it would evaporate. So you had to inject it in the soil to have a direct impact. But once everybody started stealing that and making meth out of it, you kind of can't get um, anhydrous ammonia anymore. Um, what do you think about uh, folks saying that this is going to spread? I'm trying to look. I'm trying to find the. Um, I'm trying to find the the comment that somebody wrote, but somebody was talking about how this is this is going to spread, or they hope this is going to spread. What it's do you think? To, I mean, I hear I, farmers I, here I, complain, but I, I don't know you, if I, I see told them you do that this. it's it's coming here to the U.S. Mm -hmm. It will come here to the U.S. eventually. Um, I sent you a link from Zero Hedge. I guess you saw that article. But um, the I'll White bring House, it up while you're talking. Go ahead. Keep the going. The White House is gaming basically um, $200 oil. They're trying to see how big of a shock that would be on the system. And according to the article, um, that translates to $10 gas. We hit $10 gas. We're done. Everybody's done. You guys are starving. I'm out of business. I'll, I'll cut back. I'll sell everything I have to. And I'll, I'll live on my own herd is what it basically boils down to. I'll go back to subsistence and survival. And here's why. Um, I've already told you this story, but I've got a, a friend down the road and he's got a dairy. It's, it's a medium to small size dairy. They milk about 7,000 head of cows. If you can believe that's a small dairy. Um, it's compared to the 30 and 40,000 that other people are. Um, he told me that his operating just just to run the dairy that's the loaders that's the feeders that you know that's everything it takes to just get the cows fed and milked on a daily basis they go through two tankers of diesel a week that's 20,000 gallons now when you buy diesel in the tanker load you get a better price it's not 5 bucks like it is at the pump but it might be $4 and um if you just put that pencil to that he's spending $80,000 a week on diesel Last year at this time, they were spending about 25, maybe, maybe 30 on the same car, on the same diesel. You take that to $10, that's, that's 200,000 a week. He, he, nobody can absorb that. Absolutely nobody. And um, they are just out of business. They're, they're shuttered at that point because nobody can, nobody can do it. it just, so, it's okay. Just I, I saw the. I saw the article from Zero Hedge was talking about mm -hmm. what you just said, the, the $10 gas. But then this is what, like, Fortune says mm -hmm. that one Washington gas station reprogrammed pumps for $10, but it's not for the reason you think. Um, oh, come on, Fortune. Yeah, it's because they're going to charge $10 a gallon. That's the reason <laughs> I think. I, I, 
<laughs> if, if you're going to go up to a hundred dollars a gallon, you know, if you get four digits, you can go to 99, 99. It's that that's what I think. I don't think they're doing that because they're going to give away free diesel. There, this paragraph says typically the price per gallon on that fuel has been in the eight to $9 range talking about 100 octane race gas. So not, not regular gas. Okay. If you, if you raise it for racing fuel, you raise it. <laughs> you, you can backdoor anything in. You can sell 85 octane for four digits, just like you can sell race fuel for four digits or av gas or, or whatever it is. The, the price is fun, it, it basically fungible. But when you see four digits on the gas pump, um, I usually fill out of my bulk tanks when I go anything, but we happen to be in town and we had, oh, Smith's Food King, they offer a, they offer a discount. You buy so many groceries and you get so much off on your, on your gas bill. And it was 20 cents off. And so we pulled into the pump, threw about 23 gallon in the pickup, $125. That, that's, that's, that was a cheap fill. Okay. When you're talking about uh, the guys that I'm talking about, when they're chopping corn, their corn chopper, they got a big cloth uh, corn chopper. They go through a thousand gallon a day in a 24 hour period chopping corn. That's a big expense. Check this out. This is, uh, they're saying anyway, in retaliation of the proposed nitrogen emission cuts, the farmers give this uh, locum, I don't know if I'm saying the right town hall, a healthy dose of their own horse shit. This is what, this is what it looks like. Whoops. Turn the volume down. You see it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you think American farmers would actually do this? Um, no, we're too spread out. Uh, <laughs> I, I think you'd see it in a place or two, but um, who's going to protest in Iowa? Um, who, who's going to protest in Idaho? Who's going to do anything like that? Uh, we're all just going to keep quiet, sell out, move down the road. I mean, I, I don't know what else you do. Um, if we can talk basic economics for a minute, the, the problem I have with most economists is um, they don't understand economics. And the fundamental building block of all economics is the creation of new wealth. OK, if you don't have wealth creators, you don't have an economy and most people don't understand what creates wealth. All new wealth comes from the ground and a farmer goes out and he plants a single wheat kernel and it grows into a stock that has maybe 60 or 100 seeds on it. That's a 100 to 1 increase. If you plant a single corn uh, kernel, it grows in and it, and it generates uh, about 3000 because you got the three, you got the three cobs on each leaf or each stock. And so the problem is, is when you're doing that, um, prices come down because there's so much of it in, in, in production. All right. Because one generates that many. So therefore you have, a, you have price discovery and things of that nature. Um, livestock is a little bit different. One cow has one calf every nine months or every year in essence. So our, our generation is slower and there's only one, we've only got one increase, but all of that is what is, has to be, is the new creation of, of wealth in society. Um, everybody else just trades money around. For example, if you go and you stay at a hotel, you're giving the money you made from YouTube or from somebody else. It, it, it just kind of gets shuffled around. There's no wealth created. Um, an argument can be made for uh, intellectual property such as this, but this is infinitely consumable. So, so you kind of have to, to discount that a little bit. It doesn't create much, but you are able to accumulate kind of like AllisonWinePromo.com. Oh yeah. Thank you for reminding so, me. I need to do Anyway, <laughs> they, they, plant, they plant a vineyard. They get one crop of grapes. That's it. They'll get one crop of grapes every year. They'll con convert that into juice. They'll take that juice they will go ahead and make a product out of that and they'll ferment it because uh, that's the product they want. They don't want grape juice. They, they want fermented grape juice, which everybody refers to as wine. And so that's how they can store it indefinitely and they bottle it and they ship it away. And that's their product. It takes them a long time to get that to market because I don't know how long they have to age it in a barrel. So um, you're talking about some whiskeys that they distill. Um, 
they'll, they'll sit in a barrel four, five, seven, 12 years, you know, before they can actually move it to market. And that's a long delay time. But that is a creation of something out of the ground. All, all new wealth comes from God, in essence. Um, I put a bull with a cow, I get a calf. Um, you plant a seed in the ground, you put water to it, it grows, it creates new wealth. You have more come from a single, and you can take one single seed and do that. Um, when you discourage that activity through some government uh, command, overreach, overregulation, burden, um, then then that's what happens. And cheap food is no longer going to be an option when the the price of inputs uh, skyrockets. It it just can't be. Well, you can't run your car off of AllisonWinePromo.com, but you probably won't be driving anywhere when gas prices hit. What, what are we, if, do you think they could go past $10? Uh, no. You don't think they'll go past, it'll go past $10 a gallon? I don't know who could buy it. I don't know who can oh. buy it at eight. Right. Good point. <laughs> well, just, if it I does, know. settle in with some AllisonWinePromo.com. You get 50% off the wine and 50% off shipping. And then you don't need to go anywhere. You can just watch the world implode and have a really nice Malbec at a highly discounted rate. These are high altitude Malbecs from very remote regions. They're very good and you can't get them at a local grocery store. Plus you can support my work. So go check that out. Um, also, I don't know. There's some coffee that out there that tastes like it should go in your car, but not twininginecoffee.com slash Allison. These are organic roasts from Nicaragua, also high altitude. There's a limited black edition right now. Also, if you're a tea drinker, you can get Katura tea. It's tea made from the coffee fruit around the bean. So check it out, twininginecoffee.com, allisonwinepromo.com. And uh, let's get back to it. Okay, so one of my... Um, one of the videos that I'm going to show you real fast is of, uh, well, let's, you know what, let's watch this one. <laughs> this is, this is a fun one. And then I'm going to show you the cows that they brought to, they brought to this, uh, government building. But this one says things are heating up since the government announced a 30% reduction in farms, combat nitrogen emissions. Frustrated farmers are now attacking police vehicles and spraying the enemy with manure. So, um, you know, <sighs> I don't see that. I mean, dude, this is, if this is all legit, like I should just say to everybody that this is all coming off of Twitter. So, I mean, I can't vouch for, I okay, can't vouch that, for the total accuracy. That's but, a chopper. That is a chopper. And what they're what doing is, is they're, uh, well, that's what they chop corn with. That's what they chop hay with. That's okay. what they chop forage with. So, so they'll move along and they'll, they'll pick up the corn, the hay, the whatever in the header. And it comes out that tube and squirts it into a uh, truck so that mm -hmm. they can take it to wherever they need it to be. It looks to me like what they're doing is they're throwing shit in the front of that. <laughs> and it's atomizing it and shooting it out the tube. And so you know, uh, yeah. what, what this video should be tell is they're fed, farmers are pissed. That, that, yeah. That's really <laughs> what it is. I should probably retitle this video that, you know, <laughs> nether, yeah, Dutch farmers are just pissed they and, are. and no, yeah. And, it, and then that's a double meaning. Cause it's a lot of, because we're talking about piss too. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, we're mm -hmm. talking about cow piss. Um, so, okay. Let's talk about big picture because there's, you know, depending on what source you go to for this, you hear a lot about like globalization and, um, mm -hmm. and p the Paris climate accord and just, uh, the World Economic Forum and, and kind of this this uh, this idea that the governments are all kind of aligning with the same purpose, one of which is in the name of of environmentalism or climate change, um, you know, changing farming methods, I guess, or just cracking. They would call it, you know, sort of cracking down on pollutants or whatever else. What what role do you think the that centralized government authorities have in all of this or, or, or is it just that we're all kind of, we're separate, but thinking about the same things at the same time. Um, let's take the two different scenarios. Okay. Let's say that they're all working together. The, the committee of 300 tells the Bilderbergers what to do, which tells the uh, uh, council on foreign relations and the WEF, and they've got all, they've penetrated all the world governments to use their term. Um, let's say that that is occurring and this is by design and it's all working top down and they are going to compel us little guys to abandon our uh, meat eating habits and switch to crickets, uh, 
Mormon crickets if you want, because they're big, uh, or anything else. We're going to switch to bugs. That's how we're going to get our food. Now, what they don't tell you is they're going to still eat steak. Um, that's that's just the way it goes. That's There's rules for thee, not for me. Um, and that's what it boils down to. Let's take that business model. And now let's compare that with a completely innocuous business model. Ne- never attribute to malice that can, you know, that can be attributed to just absolute stupidity. And let's just say that governments of the world are just equally as inept and stupid. It doesn't matter. The outcome is the same. They're, they're, they're trying to compel somebody to do something that they literally can't do. And they're going to drive the people out of business doing that. And the result of not having these farms, not having livestock, not having things like that, is there's going to be a shortage of food. Whether that's by design or whether that's by accident, that's where we're headed. And Michael Yawn, he, he, he hit it right on the head. Um, he said that um, you got to understand farming. Farming is all cost up front. We spend this, we spend that, we spend everything. The leanest time in our bank account is right before harvest. It doesn't matter whether you're harvesting grain, whether you're harvesting corn, whether you're harvesting milk, whether you're harvesting beef like I do. It really doesn't matter. At the very 11th hour is when you are financially the worst because all of your money's walking around or it's sitting in the field and you haven't sold it on the market and, 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 and got paid for it. His theory was, is they're going to let everybody get stretched out and then they're going to raise the price of fuel to the point that the farmer is going to look at this and he's going to say, okay, I've locked a grain contract in at X amount. Right now, I'm upside down on that. So right now, my my whole grain crop has cost me $100,000 to put in, right? But it's going to cost me $200,000 in fuel to get it out. So what do I do? Lose $300,000? Or do I just walk away from the $100,000 and leave it sitting in the field? And that's the option, and that's what's happening. Now, the advantage we have in America is we've got space. The disadvantage they have in Holland is they're, they're tight. They, you've got you've got cities right next to farms, right next. These guys are already maxed out. They're doing everything they can. They, they cannot, they can't go next to a, to a different acre. They can't do something else. Literally their farms are landlocked by people, by cities, and they're at max production right now. And so it's, um, it, 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 it doesn't paint a rosy picture. I'm so jealous of the reporters there right now. <laughs> I, I never got to cover anything where somebody brought cows to the government buildings. I bet there's a huge mess left behind too, like a bunch of just because cows don't care. They just they'll just poop anywhere. They do not care. It's all natural. <laughs> yeah, but I, we, you know, I, the, the it's all part of the green agenda. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it, it, it it's depending on what you're feeding it, it is. But we had cattle next to us for a couple of summers and they, I think they moved them because our hot wire wasn't working well and their cattle kept getting into our horse pasture. And then eventually I just look out my bedroom window and I'd wake up in the morning and there'd be a steer right outside eating our lawn, which is great because it's cheap lawn care. Um, but but uh, they, they moved them, I think, because that wasn't great for security for their cattle. But um, well, I'll let you in on a little secret. I've got a few yeah. sweethearts that if you dumped right there in front of Parliament, they'd have cleared the whole place out. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, they're, they, they're not gentle like these like these milk cows. Well, <laughs> where are the cowboys? Out. Like you ride you ride cattle around with your your uh, or ride horses around with your cattle. Like why aren't any of them coming in with lassos and just like whooping butt over there? I mean, where where why are they all tractors? They got, they've got domestic <laughs> herds. Those, those oh. herds over there. Um, my, my grandma went on a tour of uh, Europe way back in the day, and she was going through Switzerland, and she was amazed. The, they had little posts or flags, and the cattle wouldn't cross them. So they all stayed in their field, quote, unquote, but there was no wire. There was no anything. And she took pictures of it. She came home and told that to, to, to everybody around here because, yeah, we have five-strand barbed wire fences, and we still can't keep them so uh, ours ours are a little more Western. We'll just put it that way. Uh, somebody asked if the sustainable agricultural model, like the Georgia interview, uh, Will Harris, if you remember him, would meet mm. the Dutch emission requirements. Nope. He makes too much poop. 
So uh, the Dutch requirements would probably say that he was producing way too much nitrogen, even though it was all going back into his soil. Then you've got that other regulation that your other commenter more about putting it on the soil isn't enough. He has to inject it. So look at what he would have to do. He would have to collect all of the manure. He would have to liquefy it. He would have to put it inside one of those honey tank or uh, well, I forget what they call them. Anyway, um, he'd have to put them inside one of those liquid tanks and then he would have to have an injector and put it in there. All that comes at a cost. Those injectors can't be cheap. Gosh, they got to be. Okay. A, a, a friend of mine had a, had a baler blow up the other day while he was baling hay. Um, mm -hmm. it, he was waiting too long for a new gearbox. The, the mechanic wasn't around. He just said, I, I can't do it. Bring me out a new one. $180,000 baler. Okay. How much do you think a nitrogen injector is? I, I'm going to guess like a million dollars. I don't know, but, but it's at least 150 and I, and I don't know what it would be in euros. And that's what they're looking at. Um, uh, those guys literally, that's why, um, uh, things like Unimogs and that were very popular over there and still are because they can use, they've got all the implements that they can fit on the front of one tractor truck in essence, and they can pull in and they can cut and do everything in one pass. They're, they're trying to get to be able to do everything in one pass so they don't have to expend the, the fuel cost. Uh, I have to ask, Matt, in the chat, you are talking a lot of, like, you know what you're, you're, uh, like, you're a firsthand witness mm -hmm. here. Are you in this area? And give us some more info in the chat if you are, because uh, you probably know more than we do. I, I have tried reaching out to all these people that have posted Twitter videos to see if they'd come on um, to see if they're actually there or they're just reposting others. Uh, okay, what about, let's, let's talk about the combination of of corporation and government um, and sort of centralization of food too uh, in that, in that regard, because it seems like depending on the farmers that I talk to, the most of them, I would say the, the majority of them feel like it would be very difficult. Like they, the ones who aren't already doing the regenerative model with feel like there's all kinds of, um, hoops to jump through in order to get to that point. Like mm -hmm. in other words, a lot of the, the time these narratives are dictated, like government wants to cut pollutants versus polluting farmers, you know, government, good polluting farmers, bad. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, I really don't know hardly any, I mean, I know a few I've investigated a few, but I, I don't know many farmers that wouldn't actually like to do more and do better in, in a lot of ways. But but they don't have them either their the resources are not there or their regulations that make it very difficult and costly for them to transition. And then you get crackdowns like this where it just, it, I don't know. It just seems like not, not the best situation if you want to move farmers in the direction that many of them, I think do want to go in. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that and then how that, how those regulations or how the, the way the government often approaches this ends up with a more centralized food system. And then we end up with these big companies and it, and this, the, you know, the, the smaller farmers who you, you might actually be able to, I don't know, you, you might, that, that would be maybe more interested in moving this in this kind of direction in a regenerative direction. Uh, it just makes it more difficult for them to, to get skin in the game. Uh, define pollutant for me first. You well, can't I don't know anybody I, else. Nobody can define pollutant. Because what somebody considers to be a pollutant, let's take the Dutch, for example, what they consider to be a pollutant is now nitrogen, right? Uh -huh. Every time you have a snowstorm, it gathers the nitrogen out of the air, it brings it down to the ground, and it puts it into the grass. So when you get a spring snowstorm, your grass explodes because the nitrogen is captured in the cold snow. And it brings it down and the grass jumps accordingly because it gets water and it gets nitrogen. Rain doesn't necessarily do that because it can't capture the, the nitrogen because it's too warm. Okay. So what I'm saying is, is if you're going to define nitrogen as a pollutant, you've just defined 75% of the earth's atmosphere as being a pollutant. We, where's the sense in that? That, that it, it, it just, it, it just decries common sense. Now, I'll, I'll answer your second question in that there's, there was a story that was told to me by, by a guy I took some classes from. 
And one of the people that he was teaching a class to, he said he was a portly fellow. He was, he was in his fifties. I guess he probably looked a little like me at the time, but he said, uh, he says, what do you do for a living? And he said, I'm a stripper. And George laughed and he said, okay. And he says, okay, so here's what I do. He says, the big oil companies get done with wells. Okay. And he says, there's still oil in these wells, but it takes a week. It takes 10 days. It takes whatever for that oil to settle in the bottom. And there's just not enough there for these big companies to worry about. So he went around and he bought all these little wells up and they call them stripper wells. So he might let them set for a week. Then he'd turn the, he'd turn the oil derrick on and he would pump them all into a tank and, and he brought it, you know, and he says, I, I can do that. And he says, the stripper market is about 3% of the domestic supply. And he says, we, we do that. Um, and he says, it's, it's a living. He says, I make between 50 and $60,000 a year chasing all this stuff around. And he says, I'm not getting rich on it, but he said, it's a living. And George says, well, why, why are you here at the class? And he says, because I'm, I'm getting ready to get put out of business and I need to know if I can challenge it. And he says, well, well how are they putting you out of business? He said, well, let me, let me explain the way environmental regulations work. He says, now the big oil companies have gone to their, their congressmen who they've bought and paid for, and they say, oh, we've got an environmental problem. All of these tanks need to have a screen on the top that they, that they store the oil in, the crude, because they, they got to put screens on these tanks because the birds fly in there and they get trapped in the oil and they die. So this is an environmental problem and there needs to be a regulation of this. And if, and, and also you need to put down a million dollar deposit in case something untoward happens. And so he said a million dollars to an oil company and screens on all the tanks. Okay. It's just a cost of doing business for them. He says, we can't do that. He says it, it's putting me out of business. And that is the purpose of that regulation was to put the little guy out of business. Because three to five percent of the market is still an awful lot of oil, <laughs> and it's a lot of money. And if they could drive that out, everybody had to come to them for it. So that's what you're seeing in all regulation: is somebody's promoting it, uh, and they're wrapping it in God, country, and apple pie, or environmental, or climate change, or or you you name it, anything you want to wrap it in. They're doing it to benefit themselves. That's the way they're getting the regulation passed. It is not for the stated purpose of the regulation. Th does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know anything about this. I, I was just scrolling through some of the comments and some old news articles that people posted. And it's going to be a total rabbit hole that has no truth to it. But I figured I would just share it. Um, because I think we have sort of, maybe not exactly the same, but sort of similar concerns here. This guy writes, one industry's devastation is in other industries, golden opportunity. We can finally start building to house the population instead of bending to the will of some clog wearing sheep shaggers. It's simple. If we want to have a livable planet, these goals are at minimum at best. And there were a lot of people commenting about the government using farmland to build more housing, basically. Mm -hmm. And I, like I said, I don't know. I don't, I don't know the, the truth to that, but well, um, over there, I'll, but I'll tell you what I've heard my whole life. Okay. You know what that guy, you know what that guy did? He was able yeah. to say that with a full belly. <laughs> Hung, hungry people don't care about building sustainable housing population. They care about eating. That's what Michael Young's talking about with human osmotic pressure. When people start starving, they move and they, and they're worse than a herd of locusts because they will break in, kill, and do things like that. Okay, so ahead, this Matt. is what this is what Mess says, our, our local correspondent in, in the <laughs> Netherlands. The farmers get as a fake narrative so certain political parties can get rid of them and turn the country into a tri-state area for their EU overlords. I mean, it sounds mm -hmm. like you could... You, you could mm -hmm. say the same thing about our country, a lot, that, that yeah. farmers feel very similarly in the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, it's the same, it's the same problem. The, their, their issue there is, is it's, it's just a smaller area. Um, if you move somebody out, okay. Population has to either move up or out. And what they're saying is, is we're, we're creating some sort of a, uh, let's take one. You guys got to take one for the team here, guys. 
um, we understand you'll go out of business, but it's better for one person to go out of business so he can house 10,000 people. Okay. Well, that's all good unless you're the guy that's starving. Uh, it get back to the old, what, what, do, uh, what happens when two wolves and the sheep vote on what's for dinner? You know, <laughs> it's, it's the way it works. So uh, if, if you don't have private property protections, and, and we're losing them here as well in our country, um, one of the most discouraging things I've heard in the last two weeks is what the Supreme Court did to Bivens. Uh, but that, that's beside the point, too. Uh, Barnes disagreed with that as well. But it, it allows the federal government and their employees to um, basically infringe on your civil rights, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Um, I, those guys over in, in Holland and that, boy, they've got a lot of freedoms. They've got a lot of protections. Um, Coincidentally, we had a we had an exchange student one time staying with us, and she, and she was from the Netherlands. And uh, my dad asked her. He says, uh, "Well, what's the crime like over there?" And she says, well, "We don't have much crime." And then he got to thinking, "Well, yeah, nothing's illegal." <laughs> <You know, laughs> yeah, good they, point. They smoke dope. They do this. How how can you have crime if nothing's illegal? <laughs> Whereas out here, the only way you have crime is you make something illegal. Um, what they're trying to do is they're trying to convert farming into a crime. And the goal is to take what the farmers have and give it to someone else through economic or other means. And so that's why these guys are pissed and they've had enough and they can see that it's done, that they've reached their end. They've suffered as long as they can. And, and this is the result. Um, you're going to get a different result here in America uh, based on your uh, demographic, you know, the, the supporters of your channel. But that other guy sent you that article that told you what that is. So, so somebody, uh, I would say, I'm trying to I'm trying to find the original comment, but somebody said that farmers just have an entitlement mentality. Okay. <laughs> which one? Uh, what? Which farmer? Well, no. Which mentality? Which, which entitlement? Entitlement, like I don't, hmm? I don't know. No, which, That's a which good question. Here That's we go. Question. Farmers have a huge entitlement mentality. Okay. Please, please elaborate on that. Okay. Could you please elaborate what they feel entitled to? <laughs> well, no, uh, what no, about, I, what I, about when no, I hear I, about I wouldn't wealth? I not disagree with that. I won't disagree I hear, with that. Go ahead, Jared. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, I won't disagree with that because I know too many of them that are on government programs. Okay. Look, you guys have a there point of confluence there. But I will tell you this. I know more farmers that would end all government subsidies tomorrow if the government got off their back with regulation. Because people, the farmers aren't subsidized. The United States food consumer is subsidized because we, those farmers can grow things at a cheaper price in the store because you as the taxpayer are paying them on the back end. If you choose to take government programs, which I don't. This is just more using manure to block roads. Um, so that's I've never seen manure oh. in quotes like that. That's interesting. Have you seen this? This one? This is, uh, I guess, we're setting spreader. stuff on fire. Yeah. Well, how, how, how well does a manure burn? Very well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's smolders for a long time it and it stinks. Yes. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about somebody asked about Bill Gates. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody loves to look at that picture. Dang. Um, That's a good what picture. Do, yeah. What do you, I mean, you know, maybe we don't even have to talk specific about Bill Gates, but you can if you want to. The idea of um, these big businesses, Bill bagging farmland, you know, just a few really rich people or, or, or big companies, uh, you know, buying up farmland. What do you think about all that? Uh, Ted Turner started that. He, he bought a big chunk of Montana and then he was going to run Buffalo on it. And so he did. Um, he wanted to turn it back to nature. I, I know some of the, I, I know of some of the guys that work for him up there on the ranch. Um, but Benny Binion also, he was he, Binion's horseshoe down there in Vegas. He, he bought a big ranch up in Montana and, and he ran it different ways. And I know people who work for him. Uh, so it's nothing new. 
Um, I don't have any problem with Bill Gates or um, let me rephrase. I don't have any problem with an individual owning anything. Uh, my, I, I, I'm a property rights advocate, so I don't have any problem with an individual owning anything or everything he can afford. What I have a problem with is a trust or a corporation or something like that that has an infinite lifespan owning that. Um, because then it can be taken out of production. And one thing that most people don't understand is that when you get to the Western United States, the federal government owns the, uh, controls the, the, the lion's share. We'll put it that way. Uh, 75% of Nevada is federally controlled land. Uh, 63% of Idaho is federally controlled land. Uh, Utah has got about 67. Um, so that means that 60% of our decisions come from the Potomac River. They don't come local. And there's not a damn thing we can do about it because if you had everybody in Idaho vote one way, um, it wouldn't make any difference because Seattle could outvote us as a city, four to one probably. And, and, and so when you get down to one man, one vote, but so if you want to talk about Bill Gates, he'll own it for a while, then he'll take it out of production. Something will happen. Things will go along. Um, it's just, it's just a nature of the business, but if it's put into the Gates trust or a foundation that, um, has no limits on its ownership or what it can do with it, um, then it comes down to people like me that just refuse to sell at any price. And so that's, that's where you're at, but eventually it'll come to the point that, um, they'll reach my price and, and I'll have to sell. It's either that or starve, but. The current rate, I'll go back to subsistence and survival before that happens and just raise my own food. So I was saying earlier how what we're seeing right now is is something that's been bubbling up for a while, for mm -hmm. several years. And this I found from, uh, I, I think this may have been a release from the government. Uh, it says government of Netherlands at the top and it's dated July, if, if they do it the same way we do here, July 2nd, 2020. I know it comes from 2020. I don't know. I don't know if they do. 7th of February or July 2nd, but <laughs> I whatever. Think, I think it's the latter, but it really doesn't <laughs> Met, met our, our correspondent can tell us what that means. <laughs> but um, so they're saying the government has announced new measures to tackle nitrogen pollution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All sectors, including farming, will have to contribute to the, these efforts, though I saw people criticizing that like airlines and other big corporations mm -hmm. are not having to do, they're not uh, straddling or, or having to carry the same kind of burden. And maybe you could talk a little bit in a second about, do you feel like farmers get the short end of the stick on that regard? Like as far as being kind of the, the ones who are, are, are required to meet certain burdens that other industries do not have to, but let's, let's table that for a second, because they say that for farmers who wish to continue farming, 172 million euros will be made available to help them innovate and to make their livestock housing more sustainable. The government will also set up a transition fund to help farmers who want to make their operation circular. Funding will also be able to make livestock farms near Natura 2000 areas less intensive. Because remember, this is allegedly about being near nature areas. Mm -hmm. The government is setting aside a further 350 million euro for a voluntary buyout scheme for livestock farmers, as well as extra money for all pig farmers who subscribe to the pig production cessation scheme and meet the requirements. So a lot of really interesting things here. Number one, okay, what if someone says, hey, we offered you money to change your farming methods. You didn't want to do it. Stop complaining. But number two, I think it's really interesting. So the government's trying to buy out farmers. <laughs> so that, I mean, I, I, I find that interesting too. Let's, um, let's, let's analyze that from the macro, okay? Okay. The government wants to reduce the food production in their country. How does that make logical sense? Well, say, say they have two, I mean, okay, I'm just going to play devil's advocate here for a second. Cause I know we have a lot of food waste in the United States. Yeah. Um, say they would argue, Hey, we've got a lot of food waste and okay. we, just, we just don't need it. <laughs> Stop all programs. Let everybody rise and fall on their own merit, but you got to do away with the futures market when you do that, because you have other people determine what your market is. It's not a free market as long as you have uh, Hillary Clinton that can trade in cattle futures. And she's got more to say over the price of cattle than I do. The Chicago Board of Trade has more to say about the, sh about the 
price of livestock, price of grain, price of coal, price of oil than any of the actual producers do because they buy, sell, and trade it on a daily basis. And the only way they money, make money is to have buy low and sell high. That means you got to have lows, you got to have highs. You got to have volatility in the market. People like us that are in the production end of things, we can't stand volatility because we can't account for it. We can't plan for it. We like a steady price so that we know we can pay our bills. We know that we can do X, Y, and Z. Uh, volatility kills anybody in the market. So the, the funny thing is, is like I say, in the macro, the government is saying, we want you guys to stop producing food for your own neighbors and friends. That's what they're saying. And we're not only going to, we don't only want you to do that. Your neighbors and friends are going to pony up the money so that we can keep you from producing food for them. Um, it, it just makes absolutely no sense unless you're back to that Malthusian principle of limiting the population of the world and that that gets you back into the WEF and if it's a top-down coordinated policy or not. Um, the results are the same. Okay, some more video I found on Twitter about the protest. So somebody else commented uh, about BlackRock and Vanguard, these mm -hmm. investment firms versus Bill Gates. What do you think about that? And they're the ones sucking up individual assets through the U.S. Yeah, they are. Will Gates sell to them eventually? I highly doubt it. Uh, they're, they're kind of in different markets. I don't know that Vanguard and BlackRock are buying up farms per se, uh, but they are buying up entire subdivisions. They're trying to become the feudal landlords of the world. And once they get the majority of uh, an area bought up, then they can dictate the rent prices. And um, you people can't afford homes. Nobody can at that point because they can buy them and then charge their rent or whatever they want. So what you're going back to is we're going back to a different form of feudalism. The only advantage I can see, well, now you got government regulation kicking its head in there. So everybody says, well, I can just go dig a hole in the ground like you want to do, Allison. I just live out of my Airstream trailer. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. Well, now the government steps in and says, that's not safe. That's not uh, whatever. Um, we can't have you guys having a, a, an outhouse because that's whole. That's just a hole. Mm -hmm. you, you can't be pooping in a hole in the ground. That That's not healthy. Yeah. And, and then you so, get like a puddle, you get a puddle on your property and they say it's an estuary. I remember, you know, one of the biggest frustrations that I had towards the end of my career in TV news was that I was covering all these really complex topics, originally buying into that whole uh, dialectic and, and mm -hmm. just very sort of oversimplified black and white way of looking at environmentalism and climate change and farming and all this stuff. And there was a day where something happened with the clean water act. And I believe it had something to do with Trump removed some, he changed some part of it mm -hmm. and everybody was freaking out in Seattle. And I, I knew enough at that point to know that it wasn't as simple as, as sort of the, you know, if you, if you think changes to the clean water act are bad, you must hate the environment. I knew it wasn't as mm -hmm. simple as that, but I didn't know much more. So I wanted to read the Senate report in order to understand what I was talking about. And I did not have time to read it before I went on TV. So what did I do? I put the one guy who was like, the, you know, this is going to help farmers. And the other person who was like, this is going to be terrible for the environment. It mm -hmm. was I, my boss goes, who's telling the truth? I go, I have no clue. I mean, <laughs> you gave me two hours to drive around and I, I can't read the Senate report. And I remember the anchor that I sat next to who had been the business for 40 years. She goes, well, why don't you just say what NBC says? Because they're usually right. And that's how these, this news often is covered. It's just mm -hmm. the reporters don't really know what they're talking about. They tend to be aligned towards Again, that uh -huh. that sort of oversimplified dialect that we're talking about—the dichotomy—that um, like if you if you're pushing back on this stuff, you must hate the environment. And there's so much complexity. And I remember one of the things I did get to read out of that Senate report was about how estuaries were getting redefined and farmers were having to to bend, you know, their their farming practices if they had just like if there was like a, a little puddle sometimes on their on their property and no you know people wouldn't talk about that kind of stuff because most people didn't even know most of the reporters that were covering it didn't know well, um so i'll tell you a true story if you want to listen to one i'll, I'll yeah. tell you a true story it happened i know it for a fact um i ended up getting to know helen chenoweth who was our representative here for a while before she died she and i got to be friends i i really miss her um uh, but uh 
a farmer laid a pipeline to service his pivot. So the water, he had it in a pump, ran it through a plastic pipe in the ground, went out to the pivot, irrigated the pivot. The plastic pipe had a crack in it and it created a leak when he had the pump on. Well, instead of fixing the leak, he decided to go ahead and let the, the pivot run for the season. And then he'd come back in in the fall and do that. Well, in the meantime, cattails started growing in the leak and the EPA came in and they told him that was a wetland. And they tried to condemn his whole plan, his whole farm under the wetlands provision of that. And he said, it's not a wetland. It's, it's a leak in the pipeline. And she actually took the case on and she helped him win that. And so that's how egregious it is. But remember, now that the Supreme Court has gutted Bivens, they can run roughshod over your constitutional rights and you have no legal recourse against government employees. That has to change. There needs to be a law passed in Congress and everybody needs to, 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 to get that done because it's not just farmers, it's anybody. Uh, the feds could break into your house without a warrant and say, whoops, we were wrong. And you, you, you've got no recourse against the individual actions. It, it's just, it's a violation, but you're stuck with it. it. Sucks to be you. How true is this, that the U.S. and Canada have been paying farmers not to farm? Yes and no. Um, there, <laughs> there, There's programs, okay? And some of the programs uh, pay people not to farm what they consider to be highly erodible lands. And uh, it all dates back to that infamous Wickard v. Filburn that uh, everybody everybody says. And um, the story I was told about Wickard v. Filburn and why everybody gets it wrong, and I have to apologize, I haven't had a chance to read Wickard. I, well, I have. I've had 10 years, 15 years to do it, but I haven't done it. Um, here's what happened in Wickard v. Filburn, and this is why everybody gets it wrong. Um, there was a turkey farmer and he raised wheat and the price of wheat was low. And so the government in the thirties during the depression, during the great, the good new deal, whatever you want to call it, came in and they offered a subsidy. They would buy wheat at a higher price. If you signed up for this program, the problem was when you signed up for the program, you agreed to only grow a specific amount of wheat, so many acres. Well, that worked fine the first year. Filburn, he grew his 20 acres of wheat like he agreed to. And then he um, sold it, got his government check. But his turkeys, then he had to go out and he had to buy feed. So he also raised turkeys. And this is the infamous turkey farmer that everybody talks about. So what happened is, is in about two years, he decided, well, I can plant another 20 acres of wheat and feed it to my turkeys because it's not going on the market and therefore X, Y, and Z. But the terms of his, when he signed with the contract with the government, he agreed to grow no more than 20 acres of wheat. It didn't say to go into the market. It didn't say, it said he will limit his production of wheat. But he grew 40 acres of wheat and fed 20 acres to his turkeys. He got turned in. He went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court made a very key statement in that decision. And it has said, it is hardly lack of equal protection and due process for government to regulate that, that which it subsidizes. That is why there's subsidies. That is why there's farm programs. That is why there's everything. Because when you sign up, you agree to be regulated by government. You're no longer a free person. You agree to abide by all their rules, all their regulations everything. You agree to have so much less runoff. You agree to the EPA. You agree, you agree to all that stuff. And people sign up for that because they look at the check. Okay. So when somebody says they're paying farmers not to grow. Okay. Let me tell you how that also works. There's, there's a side hill. Um, is there any way you can pull up one of the pictures I texted you last night? Just out of curiosity. Uh, yeah, I can try. Which one? G give me the big one. The, the one that's the furthest. Zoom oh, of you, of you out with your cattle? Yeah. Yeah. I'm moving cattle there last night. Okay. Time. Yeah. Give me a second. Okay. Yeah. I'll let you do that. Well, anyway, so what happens is, is the, when, when the first, uh, uh, oh gosh, um, I should know it right off the top of my head. Anyway, when the first set aside program happened in this area, what happened is, is everybody knew it was coming. And they went out and they disked up their side hills. I mean, literally sagebrush side hills, never been farmed in their lives. 
They, nothing happened, you know, but they met the slope requirements. They met the uh, erosion requirements. So they went in there and they dissed up all this land and they planted grain in it for the first time in history. Well, they dry farmed it. It didn't grow. Nothing came about. And so it, uh, but it qualified for the government program because they could show that it was farmed and that they were, that it wasn't ideal ground and it had the slope and it had, it met all the criteria. So uh, then they got to bid it in and I, I there was a hundred thousand dollar limit per person on it. And I know a lot of people that maxed that out. Um, and this is in the eighties. This is when a hundred thousand was, was a pretty good chunk of change. <laughs> it'd be like, Oh, it'd be like a, yeah, it'd be like half a million today. So anyway, yeah, this would be an example of it. So let's just say for the sake of example, they came in and they, and they disc up some of those side hills. Um, you, you can't, that's pretty steep stuff. But anyway, that, that would be the kind of, that kind of uh, acreage that they hurried and got into the, the set aside program and got paid for that had never been farmed in its life. Um, does that make sense? So mm -hmm. from that program, others came in and now people put their pivot corners on. So if you've got a pivot, you've got a square acreage that's about a 160 if you have a full pivot. And when the pivot goes around, it misses all the corners because it's round and you got a square. And so then they'd enroll their corners in, in a different program, which they never intended to farm anyway. And so the, the, the stuff that got set aside and that is all a marginal ground. And I have a friend who's got family down in Texas and, and all of that's in the set aside program. Mm -hmm. And they're making more off the set aside program than they ever did farming cotton. And so it's just, it's just sorry. Okay. One thing I learned recently was that there's something called farm diesel and then just regular diesel. There is. And, okay. But you can only use farm right. diesel right. for your farm to toys or, you know, equipment. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's because it's cheaper for the farm. So it just, just the government manipulation of gas okay. prices and everything well, and all this. No, stuff. No, and then no, why is farm diesel, diesel more expensive? farm diesel is a little different. Okay. Okay. But can you answer this question too? How is diesel yeah. more expensive? Yeah, I can. I, I actually do know that answer. Um, but uh, diesel is a byproduct of when, when, when they run oil through a refinery, diesel is basically what's left over. It's the dregs, right? But diesel isn't made unless gas is made. Mm -hmm. They don't make diesel. Diesel is the remnant. All right. It used to be a lot cheaper, but the more diesel pickups and that came on the market, now it became in supply. And so now diesel is more expensive. Now, the only difference between farm diesel and road diesel is the federal taxes. That's it. It's it's identical stuff. Okay. They put red dye in farm diesel. So when you hear somebody say they're using red yeah. diesel, okay. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's red. That means it is not they have not paid federal tax on that. And we use that in tractors. We use that in things like that because that that's just one of the, the perks they give you. They knock 18 cents off the, off a gallon. There you uh, go. So is regular gas. It's also a byproduct of oil refining. Possibly you, you get down to the dregs and that's some, so I don't know exactly what the hierarchy is, but it's, <laughs> it's just to distill it. Is what it boils down to. Uh, think of it like a whiskey. You get your first run, which is high proof. You, you know what I mean? You can get your mm -hmm. higher proof stuff, and then you wind up with the mash that's left in the bottom. Uh, people around here buy distiller's mash all the time to feed uh, livestock and feedlots and things like that. And there's, it, it's literally what's left in the, the jug. It's, it's basically all the tailings, all the solids that are left after they've evaporated all the alcohol out of it. Mm -hmm. Somebody wants to know your opinion on the dead cows in Kansas. Uh, I, I think your Georgia farmer nailed it. I, I think it was just too hot. Um, everybody I've talked to said um, they're there on bare ground. They're, they're hella fat. Um, it was the first heat of the year. There was no way for them to get away from it. And also it didn't cool down at night. It, it, it stayed 95, hundred degrees at night. Mm -hmm. and, you're and you're a cattleman them. though. Yes. Tell us a little bit about, about cattle and their their sensitivity to to those kinds of environments because oh, you know how does it affect them cattle are tougher than hell believe it or not and they die on a whim and so. dumber than hell 
Well, <laughs> it, it depends whether you're trying to get them to do what you want them to do or whether they want to do what they want to do. That's they're, true. They're, they're smarter there was, than heck. There was one to. or two. Yeah. When I was talking about the cattle that, <laughs> that were next to us, there was one I named Tux. I have a feeling he's not here any, with us anymore. He's probably somebody's hamburger, probably digested by now but but i almost adopted him i just didn't have i wasn't going to do the fencing i couldn't we couldn't afford it but he was so smart he would come hang out with the horses and everything i was kind of sad to see him go so you're right you're right they're smart if they if it's like their their will is to be smart and figure out their way the only thing more destructive than cattle is elk though oh they yeah. can just maul stuff around they'll get through fences they'll if they want to get in somewhere they'll they'll get in there and then pretty quick you got a hole and this that and the other but uh, I, I tell my niece this all the time. Uh, livestock has one goal in life, and that's to die on me before I can get them to market. It, it doesn't matter whether it's a calf, a cow, or anything. They figure out a way. They lay upside down. They can't get up. Gas builds up in their stomach. They smother because it pushes on their diaphragm, and they die. Um, you'll go out and you'll find two or three out on a mountainside occasionally that have done that. They, they just lay wrong, and they get upside down, and they can't stand up. Um, otherwise they get sick, they die. They're just like anybody. They, they, they contract uh, diseases and such, but those, those cattle there, um, you got to remember they they've been fed all they can eat because they're in a feedlot. Um, and that's what their goal is. Their goal is to maximize their gain and to maximize the fat and to maximize the marbling. So, so they're a very high fat, um, animal to begin with. And, and like, uh, Will said from Georgia, they probably got three quarters of an inch of back fat and, and, and they just, they can't get away from that heat and, and they couldn't, and they couldn't breathe it. And they just, yeah, they literally just, just suffocated and smothered and it cooked them. They could not dissipate the body heat and, and they cooked from the inside out is, is what I'm hearing from yeah. everybody. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's talk before we go, let's talk a little bit about yeah. water. Um, and you know, I, I heard a long time ago that the guy who, that Michael Berry guy who predicted the 2008 housing crisis and, you know, invested all the money and made tons of money off of it, that the big short, great movie. If you haven't seen it, uh, the big short, but he's like, that, that's basically the, sto the story about him and his investment firm and everything. Anyway, so everybody likes to hear what he's doing because he was one of the few people that was, was you know, able to sort of foresee what was going to happen with the housing market in 2008. And then he, he played the market. He bet against the market and he won. But he started investing, so I heard, in water. That was like mm -hmm. his his new thing. And um, and so how, how will... Besides, because we've talked about government manipulation, regulation, and that kind of thing, but how will actual issues like drought, or, you know, w lack of water, that kind of stuff, and what are you all seeing? How how does that play into all this too? Because we're seeing headlines like this, um, and and I don't know how much of that is also manipulated. You know, we're diverting rivers, and we dam this, and we, uh, you know, we've been doing stuff for years to to to, I don't know, manipulate how, where the water goes. People want to live in places where they would be, you know, unlivable if you didn't do that. We're running out of, I, I just, I don't know how much of this is just natural and how much of this is because of bad practice over decades or what, but I know it's going to have an effect. I know it, it has effect on hay farmers at least because I buy hay for my mm -hmm. horses. Mm -hmm. um, they were talking $500 a ton of hay in this part of the world come fall. I don't think we're going to get to that. Uh, the highest I've heard right now is a guy sold his for three twenty-five, and it's going to China. They're going to ship it up to Washington and put it in a compactor and then send it to, over in containers to China. So it just disappears from this part of the world. So it's gone. It's like lighting a match to that hay. Now he's getting paid well for it, but um, that's just the way it goes. So that is no longer available to people like me. Now, fortunately, now last year we, we, um, uh, we had a rough year last year. We didn't have any measurable storm to speak of for 18 months. So it, it was it was pretty rough. We had nothing in the winter and that. And that's why uh, we ended up having a lot of grasshoppers um, and uh, things like that, that that ate everything that was green. Um, my cattle, my calves, when I sell them in the fall, I usually get around 575 to 600 pounds out of them. Uh, last year, they were like 475. It, it was they, they were way off. They just didn't gain because they didn't have anything to eat. Um, this year, we've had a lot of storm. We're one of the only green corridors around. You go north of us, it's really dry. You go south of us, it's really dry. Um, 
th this Colorado River is, is pretty bad because it feeds Lake Powell and it feeds Lake Mead and it actually goes into the into into Mexico. Um, but uh, a lot of Southern California gets their drinking water out, out of that, out of Lake Mead. Um, they pump it over the hill there for them. So they're getting to the point now where they call it the dead zone or dead water when it's going to be below the, the, the pipes that they pump over for, for drinking water. And that's going to put a pretty good, that's, that's going to put a pretty good squeeze on some people. Um, in this part of the world, when you don't have water, you don't grow crops. Uh, nobody around here could plant corn this year to speak of. There's a few here and there, but uh, they didn't have the water to, to, to raise it. Uh, hay is going to be at a premium because people don't have water to raise hay. Uh, it, it's getting to the point that I would probably make more money selling my hay than I ever, than I'm going to on my cattle this year. So mm. I, I have to think about, think about that. Uh, can I put a thousand dollars worth of hay, uh, in a cow? So she'll give me a $900 calf. Yeah, probably not. Cause I can't make that up on volume, you know? Um, as the saying goes, if you're losing a hundred dollars a head, you just buy a bigger truck so you can carry more to market. Uh, but that's, that's not a good way to go. So that's what you're seeing here. Um, there's a saying that dates back to the 1800s in the West that whiskey's for drinking water's for fighting. There you oh, go. Dude, how good am I? <laughs> All right. Thank you. I I'm like, Oh, so that's, that's, that's a, that's, that's a real journalist right there, man. Brings there a comment go. right in as he says it. We didn't even you plan bet. that. You bet. No. Um, it's, it's funny cause I can't see the chat. So, so you do. Oh, you can't. Oh, yeah, somebody just said the same thing. Whiskey is for drinking. Water yeah. is for fighting. Water is for fighting. And that's why Western states are on a prior appropriation doctrine. That's why we're not on a riparian doctrine. We're on a prior appropriation doctrine. Meaning the first guy here has the first right on a stream. The second guy here gets what's left. <laughs> the third guy gets what's behind him. That's how a prior appropriation doctrine works. First in time, first in right. Um, and yeah. So that, that Colorado river, it's, it's, uh, I don't know the composting toilets work well. Cause you still have to smell them. You don't get rid of that. stuff. <laughs> but I, we stayed anyway. in a tiny home once yes. with a composting toilet and I couldn't smell anything, <laughs> but I will it tell was you this. Good. Okay. In Utah, you cannot capture rainwater because Utah owns the rainwater. It, so it, it varies by state. Um, now the guy at Nestle, he tried to buy up all the springs. I mean, Nestle, Nestle is one of the biggest producers, producers of bottled water that there is, um, simply because of that. Mm -hmm. um, Somebody was oh, talking about Nestle, too, in the I, chat. I'm a cow-calf operation. Yeah, I saw that. Chat. I thought you so, said you can't see the chat. Well, when you bring the, when you bring the comments up. Oh, okay. Gotcha. But I can't see as they're scrolling by. But I, I run cow, I'm a cow-calf raiser. Um, I, have a, I have a mother cow herd. And uh, I put bulls with them. And every year my cows have a calf and that's what I sell. I raise the calf up to a certain age when it can be weaned from its mother. And that's what I sell. And I keep the, I keep the mother cows and retain them until they get too old. And then, and then they go down the way. Mm -hmm. And then did you already say you do some grass fed also direct to consumer? Anybody that wants it, I will, yeah. I will raise them for, yeah. In fact, that would be my goal is, is to do what, uh, um, the guy in Georgia is doing, I, I can't do it at his scale. I, I can't uh, because I don't have a 12, I don't have the opportunity to, to graze them for 12 months. We have uh, we have six months of winter here. Um, and that's just, that's just a function of living above the 42nd parallel. It just, it just happens that way. Mm -hmm. Be very careful how you respond to this one, because we are live on YouTube. Maybe the cattle had a shot. <laughs> Did they, were they vaccinating these cattle? Cause I, I know they were vaccinating. Um, the, all, the cattle zoo near us. all cattle get shots. All cattle get shots. No, but yeah. for, uh, I think, yeah, I even, think they're the specifically related to COVID. No, no, it wouldn't be for COVID, but would it be, but what I'm saying is, is um, the, they've got black leg, uh, heifers have to be vaccinated against uh, brucellosis, rheumatic fever comes from brucellosis, things like that. So anything that goes into a feedlot, they will, um, they, they will, they will doctor tremendously yeah mm -hmm. um and i wonder what would happen if grass, the ones yeah. i sell to to friends and neighbors or anybody who wants to contact them is uh grass-fed grass finished mm -hmm. one so of your neighbors is huh 
Did you say one of your neighbors? No, no. That's what I sell to friends and neighbors. Oh, There's that's grass, what you grass, sell to friends grass and neighbors. Yeah. I, I don't have a feedlot. I don't, I don't run them through a feedlot. Uh, I don't have any confined animals. They just walk around in the field and I, uh, I just let them eat natural grass. Mm -hmm. I wonder what would happen if water becomes a global commodity and we start shipping water outside of localities. Um, uh, I don't, I don't think you could with, with $5 diesel. Uh, however, if people get thirsty enough, they'll, they'll drink water and they'll pay for it too. And you, you'll pay out the ying. Um, the question is, is, is what's going to go, what's, what's going to be worth less first? <laughs> what, what you've got or the money you've got to buy it with. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that, that's where you're stuck. There's nowhere to run. Fe mm -hmm. Fellow uh, cattleman rancher uh, here, a regenerative farmer in the chat. Hopped on, missed the Dutch protest, but listening and hoping to learn a bit. Any anything you'd like to share with a, a fellow cohort, Jared? Uh, yeah. Get out now while you still can. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't looking good for the home team. I'll guarantee you that. But, <laughs> um, uh, but the flip side is 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 yeah. I I I can I can drive up the road a mile and I can eat for five. I can eat for five years. Mm -hmm. Because I can. I, I can, uh, I can, I raise my own beef and I can preserve it. And, um, it's, it's a very nice thing to have in a food shortage. Yes. And not only that, but I have fought, I fought with the federal government for my water rights here in Idaho. And I've, I've got a high priority water right. Mine date back to the 1870s, 1880s, actually. I settled with them in 1880. And so that means that I'm ahead of everybody that came after 1880 for, for my stock water rights and things. Mm -hmm. Water rights is something I didn't know anything about until I moved out to Washington. Mm -hmm. And now the issue is starting to become uh, endangered species, uh, salmon specifically, right. and mm -hmm. who takes priority. But let's go. But that, one that last okay. Thing. Once again, that is that's just an excuse to try to take property from somebody else. That's it. Because remember, uh, there's there's nothing that they propose that doesn't seek to take private property. Private property is the only thing that's worked every time it's been tried. You see, let's just say for the sake of example that everything I've got is private land, okay? And mm -hmm. I turn a million head of cattle out on it and they graze it into the dirt every year and it doesn't come back. Guess what? I'm out of business, right? So it's not sustainable. So people like me, see, I'm a fourth generation rancher. Um, my great grandfather got here in 1878. And he settled in here and he started raising cattle and uh, we've, we've kept it up. There's a lot of us in the family that do um, through all the various branches, but uh, he had 13 kids. <laughs> and so it, it, I guess there were cold nights and they didn't know what else to do, but that was kind of the way that boiled down. And so there's a lot of us that are still in the business. Um, and some of us have gone into politics. Some of us have, have got productive jobs, but uh, the rest of us are staying in the livestock. Why do you think it's about private property if, uh, like, it was an issue I covered quite a bit mm -hmm. and, yep. and would interview the farmers who basically, like, they couldn't water, they couldn't irrigate their land because, in fact, I should have had one of them come on and talk about this. He's he's up in, um, you know, north of Seattle, and I used to go out to his farm all the time because mm -hmm. he couldn't irrigate until the water levels rose to a certain in a certain level. Okay. Okay. Um, what what he probably had is he had a storage right in a reservoir. Okay. And and the reservoir had to build up to a certain level, and that's when his water right kicked in. Right. That that's sense? what I mean. That's what that's right. what a lot of it is coming right. down to is that the fish are getting a water right that supersedes right. the farmers. It's and then nobody's taking their land, but I mean they can't do anything with it. They're, they're well, stuck. Well, that that would be a conditional property right, actually. Um, the ones I the one I'm familiar with is the one that was uh, oh gosh, Klamath Falls, and that was a government project that built that reservoir. And remember, if you take government money, it's hardly lack of due process or equal protection for government to regulate that which it subsidizes. Yeah, and they subsidized it. And they regulate it accordingly. And so yeah. that's what it boils down to. Um, yeah. I'll tell you this little story. So I had a, I have a cousin. She married a guy. And they're from San Diego. So they came out here a few years ago. They're going to come out again this summer and see me. But they came up here. And uh, we went up to my my place up by the Utah line. And in my corral, I've got a pipeline. And my, my hydrant's open. And the water's running there. And so we did a tour and we saw the, the, well, I live on the Oregon, I live on the California trail. 
And so we took them up, we showed them some rocks where people had written their names on the rocks and carved their names in the rocks from 1865 on, you know, and it, it's pretty neat. It's called register rock. And, and so we, we took them and I showed them that. And then on the way home, we were thirsty. So we pulled into my place and we went to the hydrant and filled our water bottles up and, and had water. And as we were leaving, my cousin's husband looked at me and he says, well, are you going to shut that off? And I said, no, no, I'm not going to shut it off. And he's, he says, well, well, doesn't that get expensive? <laughs> and I said, Chris, I'm going to explain something to you. I own the water. It's mine. I can do whatever I want to with it. I don't want to shut the hydrant off because I don't want the spring head to seal up. So I just let it run all the time. So it's always flowing. And he, he had a hard time believing that because he had never, ever had access to water that he didn't buy from the water company there in town. And so it's, it's a different mindset. You, you don't understand this, but I'll answer your question about why it's always private, private property rights. Who else has anything to give? When, when government comes in to take something, they don't take it from themselves. It's not government taking it from government. It's government taking it from a private individual because private property is the only thing that works every time it's been tried. And that's the only people that have anything to yield. So what would always happen with environmentalists is they'd come in and they'd say, okay, and I'll give you this example. Allison, you've got a hundred dollar bill. I've got nothing, right? So I come in and I say, Allison, I want your hundred bucks. And you say, you're not entitled to it. It's my money. I own it. And I say, well, okay, no, I want it. I want it. Let's compromise. Why don't you give me five? And just to make me go away, you give me the five, right? Who's out in this equation? Me. Yes. Why? Because I started with nothing and I wound up with five bucks. But guess what? I'm not done. Now I'm going to come after your other 95. And I'm going to create some reason, whether it's fish or fowl or anything else, to weasel you out of the other $95 (laughs) because I don't have anything. And that's what you're saying with government regulation. Everything they do beats the private property guy over the head because the private property guy is the only guy that has anything to give. But let's let's say the private property guy is doing something that makes a shared resource less usable okay. um, or depletes it in some way that, you know, who's, like who's damaged? Li- yeah. So then then what's who, the role who, of the government? Who, who's damaged? Uh, the community. Well, who in the community? The people who want to eat salmon or the, <laughs> okay. the, the, the animals that eat salmon, the killer whales. <laughs> okay. Um, so the people that are worried about the salmon runs up to Columbia, are they going to go out and they're going to stop all the sea lions and killer whales from eating the salmon in the Atlantic? Or the so is your is your point that they, they go after... My point is they're not looking or- for a solution. They're looking to beat somebody over the head that they can. Does that make sense? Or they prioritize who they want to beat over the head. There you go. Well, we can't do anything to the, to the, to the, we can't do anything to the orcas because that's all natural. Well, yeah, but I'm all natural too. <laughs> it's just, it's we don't want to know what you're doing. wearing under the desk, Jared. Hey, okay. I'm, not standing, I'm not standing up for a reason. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. no, so the, so the reality is, is okay. The courts handle such situations like that. If I have a problem on my place that trickles down to my neighbor, it's my neighbor that's damaged and he can sue me for the damage. That's how, that's how property disputes are resolved under common law. And that's how they should be resolved of there. Government has no role other than to be an independent, they they call the balls and strikes. They're going to be the umpire and that umpire should be the court and the court should not, should not take sides. That's why justice is theoretically blind even though it's not. Uh, The courts side with the government 99% of the time, especially if you live in the Ninth Circuit like we do. Biden will win the Tour de France. (laughs) He might. Not after the video I just saw of him on his bike. Okay, last, last, real, really last question to kind of wrap it up. Um, So again, going back to this, this program and, and, and our, again, our, our local correspondent, Meh, um, was saying that there was like millions, like hundreds of millions of dollars set aside for this, but that mm-hmm. that since the beginning of these regulations, 
in these programs in the Netherlands a couple years ago that the, the goalpost keeps changing and the rules are changing. And part of the frustration that the farmers have is that they just, they feel like they're getting jerked around. They, there's right. no end in sight and they're finally just like, and then done. And, but, but if they're saying, you know, Hey, we offered all this money, um, <laughs> the buyouts and the innovation and they, they explain all this stuff that they're going to do. Um, you know, what, what do you think about what, I guess, what do you think about the, the money part of this? Because you mentioned earlier, and I mean, we saw this with COVID, but you know, bailouts and, uh, and we've seen it before, like, like you said, it's nothing's free, really. I mean, it, the, well, it, me, the money comes let, with. Let me, let me tell you deal. the way I would handle COVID bailouts. Just, just complete aside. Okay. Every business that got shut down by the state, I is entitled to a regulatory taking. And they need to file their regulatory taking against the state. Because the courts have said, we don't care why you take it. The fact is you took it. Now you got to pay. And everybody that has last year's receipts, the year before that's receipts, and the year before that's receipts can show how much the shut how the how much the shutdown damaged them. And it's by regulation, it's a regulatory taking. I think all those need to be pursued for courts because that's how you bring government to the milk. The only way you stop a thief is you allow him to pay for it. Okay, now I'll get off my soapbox. But we'll talk okay. about this right here. Okay, so you're my neighbor, Allison. Okay. And I come to you and I say, I want to buy your, I want to buy your place from you. And I'm going to give you a uh, hundred thousand dollars. And you look at me and you say, well, it's a very generous offer. Thank you. I just don't want to sell my place. We like living here. We like raising our chickens. We like raising our, this, we, we just enjoy doing what we're doing and we enjoy doing it here. And I say, okay, so I go and talk to government. And I get government to start to put the squeeze on you with regulation because I don't want you there. I want to be able to buy your place from you. And then government starts getting onerous on you and puts the squeeze on you. And you basically, they're trying to compel you to move. And I'm the only available option to buy you. Is that right or wrong? You mean, is that coercion basically? Like yeah, you're, it's government yeah. coercion. Right. But it's for a specific goal because we don't want you there. Okay. Now at the end, we go to court and you file a civil rights action or you whatever. And you say, look, the government's taking sides here. They're trying to do X, Y, and Z. You know, it's the county government. I can file a, I can file a 1983 action against them. And we do all this. And then I come in as a defense and say, oh no, 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 no. We, I offered her money for this way back in the day. It's irrelevant whether she wanted to sell because I offered her money for it. No, 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 no. That's what, that's what you're reading in this article. The government says, hey, we want to buy your stuff from you. <clears throat> and the farmer said, no, we're happy farming. And so what the government did is they sought to make regulation. They try to make mm -hmm. it so onerous as to force you out of business. And then I they're going to use this as the excuse. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I... I remember when COVID first started with like, we're going to incentivize that you get vaccinated. And then it was like, uh, okay, you didn't. So now we're just going to, you just can't stay here. <laughs> you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Well, we're <laughs> like you're really going to, we're really going to incentivize you because we're going to shut your business down. If everybody's not com compelled doing what we want them to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I'll tell you what, I, I wanted to issue this challenge to Viva Fry for a long time, and I'm going to do it here on your stream. And then you can, you can see him do it. He was complaining during the COVID lockdowns in Canada about all the things the crown was doing. They were doing this, they were doing that, they were doing something else. I want to challenge him and I'll challenge every one of you out there as well. Read the Declaration of Independence and read the Constitution. If you think that anything was put in there because those guys didn't experience the exact same thing that Viva went through, you're crazy. They dealt with the crown and they dealt with the crown in 1776. That's why they rebelled. That's why we had a theoretically free country from that point forward, because everything you can think of happened to them. They were forced to, they were forced to quarter troops in their own homes. They, they were arrested on their way to and from the polling stations. So they couldn't vote. They, they, they were, you, you just go through the whole thing. Everything Viva Fry complained about, the shifting goalposts, this, that, and the other, our founding fathers experienced 
That's why it's in the Declaration of Independence. That's why it's in the Constitution prohibiting government from doing those things. Now, what government does is say, well, we didn't do that. We did this, which is completely different than that. This, this is, this, these aren't oranges. These are uh, 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 some other kind of fruit that resembles an orange. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Final question. Very important as we mm -hmm. hit uh, July 4th. How much Eat do you steak. predict hamburger will cost in two years? Huh? Eat steak. That's what I say for July 4th, eat steak. Oh, but how much, the last question I'm going to wrap with, how much do you predict hamburger will cost in two years? It depends on how many of us are still in business. <laughs> okay. Or if you're raising your own cattle. Or if you're raising your own. Yeah. Okay. Or I'll, if you're I'll, shooting I'll, elk. We've got, we've got an interesting scenario here. Uh, Robert Barnes mentioned it on the Sunday stream. Um, it, and I didn't realize this, but the, the grocers, um, are suing the big four packers. The big four packing plants control 80% of the market. And, and, and so this is why I can't really give an, a, a, an, an answer to that question is because there's a lot of things up in the air. Eight bucks is going to happen this fall. Um, it already has in a lot of ways. Um, if, you're, if you're raising grass fed, grass finished, phew, yeah, it's good. See, I'm charging five and a half this summer. I'm charging five and a half this fall because that's what the local price is in Boise for hamburger. And that's just 80, 20 chip. That, that's nothing special. So anyway, um, what we have here is you've got a monopoly where the four packers control all the supply to everybody on the top. Now they're trying to file a class action against the four packers, the big four. Uh, I found out last fall, the feedlots are filing a class action against the big four from the bottom. And so uh, I'll just give you this. Do you know what a monopsony is? No. <laughs> okay. You know what a monopoly is? A monopoly, yes. Yes. What is a monopoly? Uh, a monopoly is control, I guess. It's somebody okay. who has the most of where, something. Or very few people control the market for everybody, right? Okay. So you've got you've got a bottleneck here where very few people <laughs> I control. I didn't study the economics, guy. obviously. I was well, a history you major. Know. That's why we're getting into this. So you've got very few people that are controlling the supply for everybody. Okay. That is a monopoly, whether it was uh, standard oil or whether it was anybody else. A monopsony is the exact inverse of that. That's where you have a lot of producers, but you only have very few buyers. You see the beef producers right now, the beef industry has both. Those of us on the bottom have a monopsony because we can only deal with one of the big four. <laughs> All the grocers have a monopoly because they have to deal with the big four. So it looks like an hourglass. They can control prices both directions. And that's why we're getting hurt. And that's why everybody is filing class action lawsuits from the top and the bottom. I'm not sure how that will resolve. But um, as the Babylon Bee said, one guy is one year older than the other guy. And he looked at him and he said, back when I was your age, fuel was only $2. Right. You know. <laughs> or last month. I know. <laughs> For a while, I was going to the gas station and I'd say, I'll fill up tomorrow. It's got to come down. And then tomorrow would be 10 cents more. And I'm like, ah, I should have filled up yesterday. Okay. Okay, so Jerry. If, if, nothing, if nothing changes, um, I expect hamburger to be well over $8 by Christmas. Someone said the 4-H kids are getting 10, those money-grubbing 4-H kids are getting $10 a pound. Different their... market. Completely different market. That, yeah, that, like how you can sell Girl lot... Scout cookies for that's, like $10. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. can't believe it. Yeah, I, try, I, I have to zip my lips when I walk past the Girl Scouts that's, when it comes to the cookie all... season. Well, that's like going to the county fair and having all the kids show their steers. And then at the end, they have that yeah. sale. And their sales are going, you know, they got a fat steer that's going for seven, eight thousand dollars walking around down there as the grand champion. Um, it's a donation that that you you, you can't base right. On. I know, but I want them to sell something besides those those artificial cookies. I just, I I, I don't I I'm like they would they don't want to hear my opinion, so I just walk past hey, the girl at table. Don't you be dissing my thin mints. Don't you be dissing my thin mints. Uh, I, I well, I, I used to like the ones that were coconut on the top with the chocolate drizzle. I can. So, do you remember what those were called? I can't remember. But um, Boca um, Sam some some. Yeah. Okay. Current competitive landscape initiated by Packers government back in the days when Sinclair wrote the jungle dysfunction due to regulations being written to help the big guys. It is. 
I say, so what and happens is, is, what happens is, is those, guys, those guys <laughs> are able to, uh, when they first bought in, uh, I'll, I'll go with JBS because they were a Brazilian company. They bought in and made, more. they started charging more um, than anybody else could. Okay, so they they gave us that was the two good years in the beef business. We went from uh, seven fifty a calf to eleven hundred dollars a calf to fifteen hundred dollars a calf in three years, and everybody said, "Oh, good times are here to stay." All they did is they drove everybody out of business that was another packer that couldn't match that price. Once they did that, boom! Now you had supply destruction, and they pushed our price down ever since to see who they could drive out of business. And now we get back to that other article I sent you about how they're talking about demand destruction on the uh, on the consumer. They're going to keep raising prices until the consumer just stops buying and they'll figure out what their margin is and they'll know how much I can raise it for without going broke and they'll know how much you can spend without going broke. And the is only way out of that is for people like you to find people like me and buy local beef from individual farm raisers. Well, I was going to ask you, I mean, last closing words for people if they want to focus on the word that Will Harris brought up many times, which is resilience. But um, I was going to look up the price of impossible burger. Uh, do you know anything about how much? I, like, so I do. I do know it's, pack it's, just, it's just not worth it. For 12 it. ounces, $7.99 at Safeway for 12 ounces of impossible burger. Okay. Have you seen the list of ingredients in impossible burger? <laughs> no, because I don't buy that shit. Sorry. Oh, I, just, <laughs> I don't buy that. No. But um, but okay, so but now everybody knows the price. But do you think, I mean, is is there a push like if you raise if you raise animal agriculture to the point where people go, well, I guess I'm gonna buy impossible burger. Um no, what know, they'll do is they'll switch to chicken or or something like that that's cheaper. Who will? Uh the average consumer. I mean, they don't care where they get their oh, protein. They ain't going to yeah. crickets yet <laughs> okay so yeah so Unless final closing done. thoughts uh on yeah people who are freaked out or maybe not even that freaked out but they're just like i just i just want to i want to not wait until there's potentially some kind of you know emergency on the horizon which may or may not come i mean i know you're you're con very concerned but you know who knows but no, if you want to do coming. something ahead of time. It coming. it's it's coming you're not going to avoid it you're not going to avoid it there's too many people with too tight of margins and nobody's getting nobody's getting what they need. They can't cover their costs. Um, if people ride out this year, it's it's going to be pretty sketchy till next year. Um, if people do, if people go broke between now and then, you're not going to see it. Um, my my advice to anybody who wants to listen is personalize your food chain. Find your local farmers market. Talk to the people who are growing your vegetables, your fruits. Uh, find people who are willing to raise you the kind of beef that you want to eat. Um, I, I was in the, well. Uh, yeah, if you want to meet him, if you want to meet in candy with the wrappers all mixed in, Will said you can get that too. You, you well, I've never seen it, but I have seen, I, like I told you, uh, I see cereal go through there. I've seen potato chips go through there. Um, they tell me that Cinnamon Toast Crunch is a big hit at a feedlot. Yeah, um, they just. I'm sure it's it. yeah. I'm sure it has nothing to do with like all the sugar plus probably the natural flavors that they put in it's there wheat. that are like serotonin. What the, it's just, just another form of wheat, Dallas. There could be nothing wrong in there. That's why your kid bounces off the walls at night. Right. So anyway, it's it, it personalize your food chain. Uh, get to know the people that are raising it. Um, if you can grow a garden, grow a garden. If you can uh, buy heirloom seeds because you can save the seeds and and have a replenishing supply. Um, mm -hmm. If you're growing something large like I am, you got to find somebody else who's doing it because you, you can't know, raise a beef by yourself. The fact you just brought that up and I don't want to take us on like a whole nother long tangent, mm -hmm. but it's so whack that if you don't, that, that the, the seeds you get from like the GMO seeds, I think that's what you're basically talking like they, oh, they any hybrid, any hybrid seed, any hybrid. Yeah. But it's just so nuts that, that we created like in the, in the name of efficiency or advancement mm -hmm. and progression, we've created seeds that you can't use again, you know, okay. or like, you know, you, that's so weird. When you go to the store, you, you got a package of strawberries and they're little teeny scraggly. They don't look good. They're not pretty. And then right next to them, you got a, strawberry that's this freaking big in a package right. which one sells <laughs> the big one the huge one because everyone yeah. wants the big strawberry they taste right. like cardboard they're not no flavor eat the little teeny one and it and it just it's exploding with flavor this is what your dad rails on all the time um 
but the, the reason it explodes with flavor is because it's got more nutrients. But nobody wants that because they shop with their eyes. They don't shop with their head. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Jared, for doing this. I really appreciate Anytime. it. Thanks, everybody who watched. Thanks for the super chats and tips and all that good stuff. Sorry. Don't forget to go over. Yes. Sorry for wasting all of your time. But No, you I mean, didn't. You we all learned a lot. AllisonMorrow.locals.com. Become part of my editorial board. Don't forget about Allison Wine Promo and TwinEngineCoffee.com. And, you know, hopefully those things won't, won't dry up. One day... Bedkey Beef might even be a sponsor for you. So we'll, we'll Oh, keep that would that be great. Line. Let's we'll all go buy Bedkey Beef. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, hey, I should give you a shout out because you were willing to take an hour and a half unpaid to come talk about this. So yeah, people want to... Actually, there were people in Idaho. So if they want to get a hold of you, how should they do that? I don't really have a good way now. Go ahead and contact Allison on Locals. Um, sign up. Or you can email me. Every yeah. I, always, I give out my email. Um, I mean, I'm at Allison Morrow Media Protonmail.com. I'll make I, sure I need to set up an email account for it. I just haven't. Um, but nothing would tickle me more than finding 50 to 75 families to just raise beef for every year. And I would get out of the game. I would concentrate on the individual. I, I would do it. I would do it in a heartbeat because I would help everybody that was coming to me. And I, and I would make more doing less. I'll be honest with you. It, it would just, it would be, a, it would be a godsend for both people. Hmm. And, and I think that's a good point to end on because like to go back to this again, <clears throat> often this dichotomy that I think is so false that gets perpetuated by these, as, as the information goes along the supply chain, not the least of which is like reporters such as myself who didn't know what we were talking about um, and, and, and would buy into the whole like farmer bad, farmer doesn't care about the environment. Why do we have these big ag uh, mm -hmm. operations that do all this bad stuff. And we're just, it's constantly the messaging is, is, is um, I think just it polarizes farmers as, mm -hmm. as if there aren't farmers who would love to move into a model that we, we just kind of, I don't know. I, I just feel like you're often fed this narrative that they just don't want to, they're just lazy. They want to make it big. They, they're, mm -hmm. they just like, you know, <laughs> it, it's specialization. It's specialization. And everybody's doing their best. That, that's what it boils down to. We do. I do my best to raise the best calf I can so that the feedlot guy can take the best calf and get it to the next stage so he can get it to you. No, nobody's trying to slip shit into the, into the system. We're, we're just not. But the way the, way the efficiencies are with, with buying feed and that, um, it has led us to a certain direction. And a lot of that is from the government subsidies. Remember, uh, Wickard B. Filburn, they produced a lot of wheat uh, because of the way they cut everything, everybody down and they paid for it. But what do you do with all that? Well, that's when the first feedlot was created because government was sitting on these stockpiles of, of grain that had never historically been fed to cattle. And so they had to get rid of it. So they started feeding it to cattle and that led to feedlots, which led to where we're at today. But it, it's industrialized agriculture is what it is, as, as Bill said. And um, it, it's just, there are those of us that, that, that don't like the model, but I can't badmouth it because that's how I make 90% of my living. I yeah. Like so again, just, yeah, going back to the point of <laughs> like the consumer as Will, Will said, right. Or, and who else said oh, it? Was yeah. it just Will or was there somebody else who said that it, the consumer is going to make the difference here if you're mm -hmm. so, and, and somebody asked too about like, can you decentralize a food system without bartering? I mean, oh, yeah. you can get close. You oh, can yeah. get close no with problem. just direct, you know. Well, I'll, I'll let you in a little secret. Okay, so the people that would buy my beef, the way it is, grass-fed, grass-finished, the whole works, they are the whole food shoppers, okay? And they'll go into Whole Foods and they will buy a ribeye steak that's grass-fed and grass-finished, and they will pay 35 to $70 depending on what it looks like, right? Mm hmm they could buy a hell of a lot of my meat at five fifty for that same price. And it comes with those rib steaks that they're buying. Right. <laughs> so yeah. that's, that's the result. And, and the if, organs. Yes. If you so, want organ meat, I'll get it to you. Most people don't, but I do. I feed it dog, to my dog. My dog loves it. So beef liver is supposed to be really good for you. It's supposed to be. It just tastes like crap, but not if you I, pate it the right way. Um, I've heard that about antelope and everybody said, I told them antelope tastes like crap. And they said, you've just never had a good antelope. And I said, yes, you're right. I have never had a good antelope. <laughs> I'll, I'll <laughs> leave you this, like? you know, yeah. The guy that used to make the best pate 
was a farmer in Seattle and he would sell at the farmer's market and I loved eating it. But um, I almost choked and died on it when I picked out a chicken and his, he had these little refrigerated contain, you know, where you, you could almost like he was trying to be like it was in France and you would pick out, Oh, I want that chicken. And he wrapped up the chicken and it was, and he handed it to me. How much do you think it costs? You told me this story. Yeah, it was um, like seventy eight dollars. Yeah. I was like, I'm never gonna. So I mean, but you didn't have you didn't have to go. You'd have to go that high. I mean, sometimes I feel like some farmers, it's, you're, you're like, uh, really seventy eight dollars. But um, he did have a great pate. So anyway, um, I, I I bought pate from him after that, but chicken from someone else. <laughs> I've offered this to Allison before, and I will now that I've been on the stream. Um, if she wants to post up, I wrote an article one time that got published in Backwards Home Magazine. It was kind of a beef 101. It's a little primer mm -hmm. uh, for people that don't know anything about the business because I get asked the same questions all the time, of course. So it's kind of like a frequently asked questions or a beef 101. Go ahead and put it up on your locals. You, If you still got the PDF, if not, okay. I'll go ahead and send it to you again. Um, just post it up there. The, the numbers in it are out of date because I wrote it back in 2003, 2004, but the information is, is, is all current and accurate. Okay. But remember, yeah. not all grass feds the same because a lot of grass-fed beef is marketed as grass-fed beef as it comes out of a feedlot because at one time in its life, it was on grass. Mm -hmm. So be careful yeah. what you're buying. Be careful what you're buying. Yeah, you do have to, you have to know. That's why, that's why again, you have to, you have to go direct. Like I, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and honestly, I've never met so far. I, I, I don't look at farmers like they're just all angels. Like any, every, to me, every industry has, has bad players and good players. Like I, you know, I, it just is what it is, but, but um, for the most part, the farmers I've interacted with are very grateful for people to call them and ask them about their operations. Um, mm -hmm. At least that's just been my experience. And so yep. I, I've never had one tell me that I'm like bothering them or, or you, I'm wasting their time. You, you can't anything. be a pain in the ass. But at the same time, if they won't show you how they're raising their food, your food, mm -hmm. I would go somewhere else. <laughs> so it, it's interesting you bring that up because um, when we got married, I wanted to source all the food for our reception locally and did. But like I, I had first entrusted the, we had got a food truck and I had the food truck guy I gave him some lists of, of people, but I was like, I want to stay in this radius. So can you just source everything from, you know, cause Seattle, I mean, it's like a bread basket. Our, our area never freezes and you can grow food all year round. We have some of the best um, livestock agriculture. And so anyway, I, I asked him about, I was like four days before our wedding uh, or five days before our wedding where he was getting the pork. And he told me, oh, I was, I met this person, this, this lady at some, burning man type concert, you know, North of Seattle. And they, you know, she does the pork here and it's in central Washington. And was, was, like, pot, sent, was pot finished pork. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Or yeah. And I said, well, what, you know, can it, like, what's the, the farm like, you know, where are, where, how are you getting the pigs or so? I remember asking some question like that and he's like, well, you have to meet them halfway. Cause you can't go on the farm. Cause they're nervous about, um, disease. And I go, huh? I, no. So if I, I, I'm not going to visit the farm. So I called this guy that I had done stories with. Actually, I believe it was on their farm. I was shooting one time and I went into the barn and a huge swarm of hornets flew up my pants and stung me. Literally my butt doubled in size and I couldn't finish my story that day. I had to rip my pants off on the story. It was terrible. But um, anyway, I called that guy and I was like, I need, I need, a pig basically. Cause we're, we're, ha we're getting married, you know, in four days, like, can you make it happen? And he did. And the funny thing was, he was like, I'll even, I can even put a picture of it up for you and like, write who it is and all. And I was like, I don't think my guests are ready for that yet, but like, <laughs> if you could just, we'll just say it's local, you know, we, we don't need Wilbur? to name it or anything. Wilbur. Wilbur. Yeah, I know. I've heard people who've raised pigs say it's, it's, it's not a fun day, the day you slaughter. Cause they're, they're, I think some people might get mad that I eat pork. Cause I've heard they're um, like really, uh, awesome animals. So I don't know if, if you enjoy, if you enjoy killing anything, it's, it's rough. I'll, I'll just, yeah. I, it, that's, that's one of my least favorite days, even though I get my hanger steaks that day, it's, it's still, it's still one of the rough days. They're just, they're just nothing good about it. Um, when, when you, when you, when you knock it down, they're just, they're just nothing good about it. And people that think they get a thrill out of that. 
there's no thrill. They just sits there and kicks and, and you, you have to hurry and go in and, 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 and take care of its throat. And <laughs> it's, it's not pretty. It's really not. I, I like this. I own a food truck. I refuse to do weddings. <laughs> I'm not going to be the rain on any bride, <laughs> bride's parade. I don't know. We really liked our food truck, but I, I'll be honest, the, our wedding planner who is, it turns out she's also a pig farmer. She asked to take all of our food scraps so mm -hmm. that she can go feed her pigs. And mm -hmm. we were fine with that. But you know, when you're rock walking around talking to all of your guests and everything, you don't have a chance to eat. So we had put our plates down and she dumped them. And we never, I, all that effort I put into our sourcing and everything, <laughs> never got wedding, I never got to eat it. Yeah. And then, so then I just ended up eating this dip that my neighbor made. It was like a dairy based dip and it had been sitting out in the sun all day. And it took me about three hours before I started puking everywhere. I puked all night, my whole wedding night. I puked all over Lynn. Oh yeah. I mean, it was, it was fun. It was, it was a really fun wedding night, but um, anyway, so, okay. <laughs> Thanks everybody for, yeah. Pigs are great at eliminating the evidence. I don't want to know. <laughs> Well, I've heard about that. I've heard about yeah. that. Um, okay. Thanks everybody for watching. Thank you, Jared, for doing this. And uh, don't forget if you are not subscribed or you're unsubscribed or whatever, share the video if you don't mind. Cause I, I don't know what YouTube's doing to the channel. Maybe nothing. Maybe people just hate the stuff that I'm doing, but it, it helps if you like share, make sure you're subscribed, all that good stuff. Cause I've definitely noticed differences with my channel over the last couple of months. Thanks again. And we'll see you later.